all of which we try to address through START, having to do with a person's vulnerabilities due to the different structural brain issues, but also their life experiences, the, the ecology in which people um, grow up, the lack of inclusion of people with intellectual disabilities and autism all create an opportunity for somebody to become perhaps more anxious and depressed than they ordinarily would if all other conditions held stable. So not only are people with IDD more vulnerable to developing mental health conditions, but the life experiences that they have create opportunities for those conditions to develop as well. And many mental health conditions often contribute to challenging behavior. And again, this morning we were just talking about executive functioning and challenging behavior, the ability to take in demands and stimulus in your environment and respond to it, whether it's internal, external, or situational. And sometimes we see that people with IDD express those challenges through um, behavior that is not considered acceptable, aggression and self and, and self injurious behavior. And so when we get referrals, most of the people um, for start and mental health services are due to these challenges of aggression and self injurious behavior. And, and some of them include how troublesome behaviors or people just not doing what is expected of them um, in extreme, what would be considered more extreme ways, is considered unacceptable in many support and service venues on the DD side. Um, and as a result, the last and least served in the community are people who have mental health conditions in IDD. These are the people where um, there's still a tendency to think that um, individuals need more restriction and more segregation in society than maybe other people with IDD. There's been some social movement toward including people with autism and ID into society, but those who have mental health issues and IDD have not really been included in this movement. There's a continued concept of primary versus secondary and that this is really a dual diagnosis. These are all kind of fallacies. Um, people really are, well, I'll tell you something. My sister is now in treatment for cancer. She actually just finished her chemotherapy yesterday. And um, I have to tell you, she needed clinical support and she also needed a person-centered and continues to need a person-centered understanding. Being nice to her and not giving her chemotherapy would not have helped her with her cancer. Giving her chemotherapy but not providing support to her about how she faces the challenges of her cancer would not have helped her very well with her cancer either. So it isn't about one or the other, it's both. So start, uh, the idea is that partnerships enrich the systems. We really believe that capacity building uh, begins with positive engagement, and the positive engagement has to start with the person being referred. A lot of people are referred with terrible reputations, and the first thing we do is we debunk those and look at the person's strength of character, their courage in working with us, and their ability to change in positive ways to promote their own well-being and for us to engage with them in that process. We also, capacity has to be part of systems change. Any, any system or service does better when they collaborate with others. So we're very, it's a big part of our mission and has been since 1988. Service recipients and their families are our most valued partners. A self-advocate uh, recently reminded me that a self-advocate or a service recipient does not have the same perspective as a family member. We value both, and we have to really make sure that we both have the individual's input and the family's input, and that we don't see them as one and the same. While families can speak for the interests of their loved ones, they don't really represent who that person is. That person stands for themselves, and it's very important that you don't ignore that individual and just have the family talk about it. We also talk about what effective services are. Again, back in the day of developing START, the, one of the things that we didn't have access to in Northeast Massachusetts was hospitals for people with ID who had mental health conditions. So we would try our best by advocating as much as we could to get people 
hospitalized when they had an acute mental health condition. So they got access, but uh-oh, it, the, the services weren't that good because they didn't know how to serve people with ID. So it really wasn't all that appropriate. And what we learned was access alone doesn't guarantee that services are going to be effective. So they have to be appropriate. And thirdly, they have to be accountable. So increases the depth of knowledge and capacity to provide services for all really relies on those three things that you have to have access to appropriate services and some accountability uh, with regard to the outcomes. In fact, that accountability is very much part of what we do with the START model. We're constantly evaluating what we do and for who we're doing and whether the benefits are what we think they're going to be to ensure that services are effective. So one of the uh, essential ingredients of doing any of this work is to articulate why you do what you do. And the public health model from the World Health Organization is an excellent portrayal of what a good public health system looks like, which includes primary, secondary, and tertiary services. Now, in a, from a public health perspective, a lot of the primary interventions are what we would call preventative. At, but in our case, because people come to start already having difficulty, we really see the primary, secondary, and tertiary interventions as crisis intervention strategies because the people come in in crisis. And those primary interventions really create capacity so that they do not end up needing more more specialized services or crisis services, but all three are provided through the START model. What you can see from looking at this um, example is that the potential impact of the model, of the intervention, increases with regard to um, the ability to support someone when you're at the primary level. So with the primary level, more people know what to do, there's a mutual understanding about how to address an issue, and there are many, many people who can benefit from it. When you're at the secondary level, fewer people know, and you need specialists to figure out what to do. Many people will benefit, but it's a specialty. It's more segregated. It's not part of the capacity of a system as a whole. You need special knowledge. When you get to tertiary, which is acute care services or emergency services, you're in the midst of a crisis and a terrible situation, most likely. There are fewer options. So if you go to the emergency room and you're very aggressive, you're going to end up with mechanical and chemical restraint nine times out of 10, because the emergency room doesn't have the capacity to support you in any other way which is why we really don't want people going to the emergency room. If you don't have secondary clinical support available to you and your primary interventions don't work, nine times out of 10, you're gonna end up calling the police for assistance, which is a tertiary intervention. They don't do therapy, they have handcuffs. That's what they do. It restricts the amount of intervention. In the START model, tertiary is considered facing the odds. We do have a mobile crisis team as part of the model that's 24 hours a day. And we do try to get involved on the secondary level before we end up in the emergency room where the police are called. But basically that is facing the odds. Secondary is beating the odds. And, and really, really primary is where we wanna be. So anytime somebody is at the tertiary or secondary level, part of our job is to learn from that experience to push it up to the primary capacity building level. And really what we're talking about is a wellness-based model, capacity to take care of yourself, capacity to deal with the challenges in life that inevitably we all face. This is a wellness-based model. And all of these factors that are listed here contribute to your wellness and, well, and your sense of health and well-being. And so, again, this is based on the World Health Organization that show that there are many, many circumstances and conditions that either undermine wellness when they're absent or promote well-being when they're present. And you'll notice that some of these you can automatically see how people with intellectual disabilities and autism are sometimes 
un, uh, ex excluded from these opportunities. So more people with um, people with ID and ASD are more likely to live in poverty than people who do not have cognitive impairment. So having an intellectual disability undermines your ability from gradu to graduate from high school, undermines your ability to get a job, undermines your ability to have the financial foundation to ha promote your own well-being. This is not because they're not capable of it. It's because it, it's expected that you are not able to take care of yourself. And this is absolutely a big factor that we need to consider. When I look at EcoMaps around the country, we see people who only have service providers, and no friends, no family in their circle of support. The lack of social connection, the lack, the promotion of social isolation of people with intellectual disabilities completely undermines their well being their exclusion from churches and synagogues, et cetera, et cetera. The fact that people with intellectual and developmental disabilities do not have opportunities for diet and exercise also undermines their well-being. So you can see that if all we're talking about is managing challenging behavior and not really having an integrated wellness-based approach, we will never move forward in building the capacity that I spoke of earlier. We will never be able to really help include people with intellectual and developmental disabilities with mental health needs in the community. So all of our model really tries to incorporate within the fabric of everything that we do all of these concepts rather than just trying to treat an illness we're trying to promote wellness and well-being this is a diagram um, that really shows you what these approaches are and really um, there'll be a lot of training on this going forward but what you need to see is that a lot of what I spoke of earlier is incorporated into this especially positive psychology which I'll talk about later what we see is that all of this has to be incorporated. And in doing crisis work, this is one of my, I think I said this many, I don't know, 200 years ago when I first started doing this work, and I realized that a crisis is a problem without the tools to address it. And I can tell you why. I was a mental health clinician when I got into this field, and half the things that I saw um, when people asked for help on the IDD side would not have been tolerated at all on the MH side. So, you know, in, on the mental health side, if somebody says boo, you're like, oh my God, they were verbally aggressive, blah, blah, blah. You know, it was like a big crisis and you had to go get screened and medicated and all this stuff. On the IDD side, people would come in and say, he broke 17 windows over the last three months. I got sick of replacing the windows. We're in crisis. So you see, it's, it's a matter of perspective. It's an absolute matter of perspective. Um, and I, I also saw being a member, I was on a mobile crisis team for 11 years. You know, people would say they're in crisis because they didn't have staff in their house. Um, you know, so defining it is very different and perhaps they were in crisis, but it really wasn't what we were defining. So I used to say that a crisis was a problem without the tools to address it. And now I have learned over time that it's not just the tools, it's the knowledge of how to use the tools. It's actually the willingness to use the tools. So remember in that early slide I said, you know, you have to be open to learning. I'm not open to learning. Some of the systems that we work with are not open to learning certain things, or it is our approach on how we're teaching them those things that don't allow for them to be open. So we have what we call a tertiary care crisis intervention perspective, where we really look at what is the capacity, because it's not only the tools, but actually the knowledge and ability to use those tools. So the tool really require discovering the strengths in all of us and and also acknowledging that what puts me in flow doesn't necessarily put others in flow so what we're looking for are the tools to promote well-being and it and really it's not about a pillar or a plan it's about the person and their strength of character it is not about a pillar or a plan it's about a person and their strength of character 
That's one sentence that I really want you to remember going forward if you're going to develop a START team. We don't reduce people to a, a plan or a magic medication. It's really about looking at the person, their humanity, their strength of character. That is the biggest tool that we have. That is the tool that we'll really, we can engage with in order to prevent the crisis from, from exa exacerbating. So the START approaches include a strength-based model, which builds practices on positive psychology, which is incorporated into everything that we do. And the premise is in positive psychology is that all people have inherent strengths and skills that promote resiliency and resourcefulness in the face of challenges. So we address um, solutions to problems within the context of the system. We really think about where does the person reside? What is their ecology? Some of you may be familiar with this from a social work perspective, that we believe that all issues and solutions come from where the person resides rather than just the person alone. So there is no problem, illness, or issue that can be addressed by just looking at the person and trying to fix the person. It's really about engaging with the system and having an understanding of what the system's needs are. And here is our three A's. Um, just to remind you what the three A's are, access, appropriateness, and accountability. Here's access. Unfortunately, what you have is what we call no insurance. That's going to undermine your access. Appropriateness. Timmy is asking Lassie for help. Lassie goes and gets psychotherapy. The help doesn't match what Timmy needs. I know you're chuckling out there. And here's my favorite one. Um, you go to a team meeting. Picture this as a team meeting. Somebody's testifying in court, and the one jurist is looking at the other and saying, I don't listen to the evidence. I like to make up my own mind. How many of us go into meetings and we don't really listen to the family, or we don't really listen to the service recipient, or we don't really listen to the occupational therapist or the teacher because we know the, all the answers, and, once we, and we're just waiting for our turn to speak? That is an opportunity lost. That is a benefit of collaboration that is undermined. And what we, the most important thing we need to do is listen. So we are an evidence-informed practice. And that means that we take, in, we take in information, we process it, we act on it, we test what we're learning, we take in more information, et cetera, et cetera, and it's this cyclical effect. So you will see that all START programs enter data into a database every single day, and that data is reviewed on a regular basis. It is not just there to collect dust, although, you know, virtual dust. Um, it is there to inform us about whether our practices are working, whether teams are doing what is expected with regard to fidelity of the model, but most important to inform us about whether or not the systems and individuals that we mean to support are actually benefiting from our efforts and whether changes need to be made as a result. We have something called professional learning communities, which help to both link systems, create community capacity, and also to build communities of practice and learning. We have a professional practice group improvement groups. For example, we have a physicians group for medical directors that meet regularly and get CMEs through Dartmouth Medical School. We provide coaching, technical support. We have office hours. We do have a certification program for coordinators and for your START program. There's something called the National Online Training Series, which we're very proud of, which um, goes through about nine or ten months a year. We have special trainings as well through that series. Series, all of which is meant to share with the network, share capacity. There's a course to prepare people for certification. There are fidelity guidelines to prepare programs for certification. We have lots of curricula um, and training throughout for th uh, throughout the lifespan. We have clinical education team meetings, which I t spoke a little bit about earlier, which are forums that are very case-specific. They're de-identified so that the community, the local community, can learn about a particular issue today. We have a network, which is a group of individuals with a common repertoire of knowledge about the way of addressing similar and often shared problems and purposes. So through our communication with each other, we become less isolated as professionals 
professionals, and we increase the ability for the people we support to be less isolated in their local communities. We have a collective practice, and it's made accessible through all the training opportunities that I talked about earlier. I have to say that um, one of the things that I've learned is through this collective practice process, we have really become much more effective in a shorter amount of time than just starting from the beginning and figuring it out on your own. None of what we do is all that fancy, but what we do is really based on learning about what is best practice. We have multimodal consult teams that we are associated with to integrate a better understanding of people with more complex needs. And again, we have clinical education team meetings. We have something called the START plan, which evaluates the needs of the individual and their system, crisis plans, service evaluations. We have a database. We provide systemic analysis, practice groups, etc. cetera. Um, our therapeutic services include in-home therapeutic supports and coaching so that it, individuals get um, their caregivers get coaching in the home with the person and the caregiver rather than taking them out, especially children. We find it very traumatizing to place children outside of their family home. It's much better to kind of work with the family on their success in the home. We do have uh, centers, which are, we call them resource centers, which are therapeutic communities where we incorporate all of the practices we talked about, cultural linguistic competency, strength-based practices, rigorous approaches to biopsychosocial assessment, positive psychology, nutrition and exercise, all of these things and other things that I failed to mention um, that you'll learn about are incorporated into our practices at the resource centers. So we invest as a system as a community in really supporting the STAR coordinator to be prepared to work in complex and uncertain contexts that demand their own autonomy, their judgment, and ability to solve problems in action on the spot. And that requires a great deal of rigor and training and, and creative thinking. So you really need to have innovation, creative thinking, and, and, this, and a skill set that really is critical in order to be successful as a STAR coordinator. Innovation and creativity occur in the context of this community of practice that we have created, and the START network is part of that community of practice. So to explain it a little clearer, it's like we're a big village of MHIDD people, providers, lovers, friends, communities. And what we're all trying to do is learn together about how to promote how every single one of us in our community can flourish. And that takes all the creativity, knowledge, innovation that we've been describing, but really the coming together as a community and sharing in what we're learning is an essential part of that process. The, the best, the tools and methods that we have are no good unless you use them and you model the way toward positive change. You model the way toward forgiveness. You model the way toward noticing all the good things in people. So one of the things that I have learned in terms of modeling the way is you never go into a system and judge them in a way that will completely shut down your communication by deciding you're superior and they're inferior, or there's something wrong with them, or the people that, the, there's something wrong with the family, there's something wrong with the person, there's something wrong with the system, but rather you model the way to being open to what's right about everybody and how we're going to engage in that and move things forward and create positive change. You need to inspire a shared vision. You have to challenge the process through inquiry and active listening. So we do not challenge the process by telling people they're wrong. We challenge the process through asking questions. We challenge the process through listening to what people have to say and finding those nuggets that can help move them forward. We challenge the process through reframing and reimagining with stakeholders to free them up to see that there is a solution to every problem. There are, a crisis is only a problem without the tools to address it and we need to find those tools to move forward. 
we also have to enable others to act. We work toward building capacity on all levels. We do not ever want to be the geniuses that have to come in and save the day. In fact, you'll see in most of our studies, when we ask families about their experiences, we don't ask them about how they're doing with START. We ask them about how they're doing in life and with their mental health system and with their child. Because really, we're trying to get everybody else to do what they want to do, and we're trying to support them in getting there. Especially because people come to start because there's a problem, we tend to be problem focused. And honestly, of course, we have to give oxygen to the system. Remember that slide in the very beginning? You can't give oxygen to the system by saying, oh, Johnny hit you with the chair, but he's got a great little sense of humor. That would not really be an appropriate strength spotting opportunity. <laughs> so you really have to get rid of the chair and calm everybody down, have a little empathy for the, pack, the fact that Johnny hit somebody with a chair. But your goal is always to encourage the heart. It's always to get back to, well, how is Johnny usually? And what, what are some of the great things that you noticed about him? And how can we get him back to that? So very important. Duckworth, Steen, and Seligman said in 2005, we believe that persons who carry even the weightiest psychological burdens care much more in their lives than just the relief of suffering. Troubled persons want more satisfaction, contentment, and joy, not just less sadness and worry. And I think that is absolutely key. And that's also true of the people who support the individuals referred to us. That if there's joy in the work, joy in the engagement, positive experiences for everyone, everyone will flourish, everyone will be in flow, and everyone will benefit from the experience. We have had directors of START programs say, not only has it improved the work that I do with people, but it's improved the work that I do on myself. Um, this practice, positive psychology, is really very impactful on everyone who you're connected with. We do have a 24-hour mobile crisis team. Um, we do insist that people actually show up when somebody is having a problem rather than chat about it because there are no witch doctors or uh, we haven't found a way to really help people give them oxygen uh, from afar. Um, we have lots of, when we have people admitted to the start centers, discharge planning meetings, um, and all kinds of evaluations and dialogue occur so that the system, the person's natural support system, paid support system, remain connected to the person even when interventions are necessary. So. In conclusion, in describing what we do with START, I know you didn't learn about any of the actual practices, but the basic overview of what our community is trying to build. And I hope this overview kind of gives you a glimpse of our values, our model, and our approaches. Um, but really, it's about systems change. And systems change has its ups and downs. And another quote from my old friend, the, the, the late, great Albert Einstein, is you never fail until you stop trying. So we as a community continue to strive toward doing great things, um, but we realize that um, we will hit obstacles along the way. But as long as we continue in these efforts, we feel that success is imminent, and we are very happy to be part of your community um, and we hope that you will become part of ours, and we look forward to further dialogue moving ahead.